Good morning and welcome as we gather for worship today. I'm still filling in for Pastor. This is my last time, so you'll be <laughs> seeing him back in action next time. Um, our service today is continuing in our Lenten series of rethinking different aspects of our Christian faith and life. Today, the topic of rethinking commitment. It's also St. Patrick's Day, so happy St. Patrick's Day to all of you. And we'll be following the order of service that you find printed in our worship folder. We begin with our opening hymn, Sing My Tongue. <laughs> Please rise as we continue on page one in the worship folder. This morning we gather as the people of God in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. 
he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing glory be to Jesus. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Eternal God and Father, help us to remember Jesus, who obeyed your will and bore the cross for our salvation, that through his anguish, pain, and death, we may receive the forgiveness of sins, victory over the grave, and finally, eternal life, inherit eternal life through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the first lesson. The Old Testament reading for this, the fifth Sunday in the Lenten season, is recorded in Isaiah 43, beautiful words of comfort and deliverance and God's presence with his beleaguered people. But now this is what the Lord says, He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Seba in your stead. Since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, I will give people in exchange for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. The word of the Lord. Our psalm for today, beautiful Psalm 121, as God talks about him as our ever-present helper who watches every, over every aspect of our life and promises to protect and guard us. We read responsibly. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. The maker of the he will not let your foot slip. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade and your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our epistle lesson is from Hebrews chapter 5, and again as we get closer to Holy Week, as Jesus, we remember Jesus going to the cross, we are told that Jesus bore our sins and the anguish that went with it, not just at the cross, but his whole life long, 
And uh, that's reflected well in our, in our epistle lesson. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and once made perfect or complete, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. We rise for the gospel lesson. We begin with the gospel acclamation. It is written, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The gospel lesson for today is recorded in John chapter 12. Jesus is referring to his upcoming suffering and death just days before it happened and the blessing that it would give. This will also serve as our sermon text. I invite you to join me as we read the gospel lesson together. And we begin. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, This voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated as we invite the children forward for our children's message. Good morning. It's good, good to see you today. I have my card with my notes on it. Do you know what the card says? The very first thing it says? <coughs> my name? Yes, sometimes I forget. So <laughs> actually, that would be a good thing to put on here. But actually it says, sing the song, because I sometimes <laughs> forget. So we're going to sing the song, I am trusting you, Lord Jesus. good. Oh, I heard you guys singing during Bible hour. You were practicing your songs at Sunday school. Good, strong, loud voices today. That was, that was wonderful. We had to shut the door over here because you guys were making too much noise. <laughs> well, today is March 17th, 
Anything special about March 17th? Yes? Jesus' birthday? Well, we don't really know the exact day Jesus was born, but uh, probably not the reason I'm thinking of here. Hannah? Seven days of spring break. <laughs> that is a good reason to remember March 17th. <laughs> yes. It is St. Patrick's. That's what I was thinking. Today is St. Patrick's Day. And a lot of times, St. Patrick's Day doesn't fall on a Sunday, doesn't it? It could fall on other days of the week. Well, who especially likes to celebrate St. Patrick's Day? Yes, Sika. Oh, well, did you raise your hand? Did you want to talk? Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, trapping leprechauns today, you know, <laughs> the pots of gold and stuff like that. Okay, sure. But but which what, there's one group of people who really likes to celebrate St. Patrick's Day. Which which country of people like to celebrate St. Patrick's Day? Yes. Um, China. China? <laughs> no, they they've got other things they like to celebrate, but not St. Patrick's Day so much. Yes. Irish, yeah, Ireland, yeah, the people, the Irish people like to celebrate St. Patrick's Day. Now, do you have to be Irish to celebrate St. Patrick's Day? No. No, you don't. Someone once told me you and I can be Irish for just a few hours if we want to be <laughs> on St. Patrick's Day. But the people of Ireland really like to remember St. Saint, Saint Patrick, and there's good reason to do so. Uh, did you know that St. Patrick was not really Irish. <coughs> he wasn't. He was English. And he lived about 1,600 years ago, about only about 400 after Jesus lived, so a long, long time ago. And there are a couple things <coughs> that I want you to remember about St. Patrick, uh, important things. First of all, he's called St. Patrick. What is a saint? A saint is what? Um. No, the word that that's not that's a word we use at church. You know, saint. A saint actually means a holy one. Now, now was Saint Patrick holy? Well, he was a sinful person just like you and I, but he was a saint because. By faith in Jesus, God gives us all of, all of Jesus' holiness, so it becomes ours. So holy by faith, he was a saint by faith, and he tried to live a holy life, but you know, we won't be able to do that till we get to heaven. Are you saints? Saint Oliver? Saint Hannah? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. When God brought you to faith, he gave you all of Jesus' holiness. So although we are crummy sinners who sin a lot, uh, God has forgiven our sins. And so we are St. Hannah's and St. Oliver's. How about that? Uh, interesting. So like us, he was a believer in Jesus Christ. That's the, the wonderful first thing about St. Patrick. He was a believer. So St. Patrick's Day is a day for Christians to celebrate because he was a believer. All right, the second thing about St. Patrick to remember is that Jesus taught St. Patrick how to love and forgive. Now, St. Patrick had a very interesting life. When he was a boy, guess what happened to him? He got captured. He was taken by the Irish raiders away from his home and his parents in England, and they took him to Ireland, and for six years, he was a slave. He had to look after the sheep and, and be a servant to the people in Ireland. And that was hard on him. 
But during those six years, he really came to, to understand why Jesus was so important to him. Now, his grandfather was a pastor, but he didn't think too much about it when he was a kid. But when he was in slavery, oh, how, how he thought about how important it was to have Jesus. After six years, he escaped. And he went back to England. And do you know what he wanted to do then after that, when he got back home? He wanted to go back to Ireland and talk to the people about Jesus. Uh, God led him to love the people who had treated him so badly and to forgive them. And so he spent the next years studying hard, because he didn't study too much when he was a kid, and he became a pastor. And finally, when he was 50 years old, he got sent back to Ireland. And the third thing is he used the rest of his life to tell the people of Ireland all about Jesus, because they needed it so very much. And he started a lot of schools, he trained a lot of pastors, he spoke to a lot of people about Jesus, and helped the gospel spread through the Irish people. And that's why the Irish people today, many of them are Christians, because of the work of people like Patrick and others who did that so very long ago. So three things. Patrick was a saint, you're a saint because of Jesus. Patrick learned how to love and forgive even the people who treated him so badly. And Patrick wanted to share the gospel with people so that they could be savior and saint, saved and be saints like him as well. What a wonderful example St. Patrick is for us and why we as Christians, even if we're not Irish, we can celebrate St. Patrick's Day for some very wonderful reasons. Now I brought these two markers with me to, to remind us of something uh, not super special, but important. What, what is the color that you wear, people wear on St. Patrick's Day? Take a look. You wear green on St. Patrick's Day, right? You see a lot of green in people today. And did you know there's a second color for St. Patrick's Day? The second color is orange. That, that that's also a color for St. Patrick's Day. So both of those colors are good, good to, to uh, remember St. Patrick by the, the Irish people. Green and orange are both. So if you don't have anything green, orange will do just fine. Okay, let's take some time just to thank God for St. Patrick making us saints and helping us remember those wonderful things Patrick did that we can do too. Dear Lord, we thank you for making St. Patrick a saint by bringing him to faith in Jesus and for doing that for us too, that we are holy and without sin because of Jesus' saving love. Help us, like Patrick, learn to love and forgive people who haven't always treated us well and also give us a desire to use our life to tell more and more people about Jesus so they can be saints also. In your precious name we pray, amen. Thanks for your help. You can sit with moms and dads and grandpas and grandmas for the rest of the service. Both of you have grandpas and grandmas today. How wonderful. All right, we continue with our sermon hymn. <laughs>
Our Lord tells us, I will be with you, I will never leave you or forsake you. You may have heard the tale about the chicken and the pig who are talking about their farmer, a farmer who liked to have a hearty breakfast of ham and eggs. The chicken said to the pig, we're going to have to contribute something to the meal. And the pig replied, yes, but for you it's just a small daily donation. For me, it is a whole life commitment. <laughs> well, today we're not going to be talking about making a small daily donation. We're going to be thinking about the more serious matter of a whole life commitment. And so let's listen well as our Savior leads us to rethink this matter of commitment. Commitment is basically dedication or an allegiance to someone or something. Commitment can be dedication to a cause like political freedom, or it can be dedication to an activity uh, such as your exercise program. I could use a little bit more dedication to that. Or it could be dedication to an organization like a church or to, your, to people, like people in your family. Christian commitment actually involves many kinds of dedication. Our, our commitment spreads out to cover all kinds of things. However, Christian commitment has one starting point. Jesus teaches us <coughs> that commitment starts with a dedication to people. And he also teaches us that commitment doesn't begin with our dedication to people or to God, but it begins with God's dedication to us. Now, if you want to turn that around and choose to start the matter of commitment talking about our dedication to God, well, that would be rather embarrassing subject to bring up because our commitment to God is really a non-starter. As, as they say, that ship sailed a long time ago when our first parents betrayed God's love for them and decided that they were going to shift their loyalty away from God onto the devil and to follow in the devil's wicked ways. And since then, all the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, yep, that includes us, begin their lives as the most disloyal, most defiant, most despicable, and most uncommitted of all of God's creatures, maybe with the exception of, of Satan. Now it defies human reason, but God, in pure grace, no other reason, was determined to stay committed to us and our welfare even after the rebellion occurred. Now, under the reality of sin, the thing that captivates every human heart, God's purpose in raising up a people who would be deeply committed to him was going to be much, much harder. Now God would first have to rescue and reclaim sinners from their disloyalty and selfishness, and then he would have to renew and transform them so that they could be restored to the original version he created. An Adam and Eve who are true full of faith and trust and love and loyalty to him. As one of our eminent Wells professors put it this way, God wants a people who are ready, willing, and able to serve him. But what does he find? By nature, we are all unready, unwilling, and unable to do so. And now if that situation is going to change, if sinners are going to be delivered from their disloyalty to God, then commitment has to start with God's devotion to us. In the text from John chapter 12, Jesus tells us about the commitment that he has to us, and he also talks about what it's going to cost him. During Holy Week, some Gentile religious seekers asked the Apostle Philip if they could have an interview with Jesus. 
That interview was set up, and in Jesus' words to them, he told them about his suffering, death, and resurrection that were soon going to take place just days away. In verses 23 to 24, Jesus said, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Jesus was telling them that the time which God had been preparing him for to deliver sinners had now finally come. The time when the Savior would glorify the Father by fulfilling the plan of salvation had arrived. And then Jesus used the example from the plant world to describe how he would bring life to people through his death. He said, unless the kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it's just a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. By Jesus' death, the death of the Son of God, Jesus would win eternal life for us all. The one seed would produce life for the many. He lets us know that this sacrifice was not easy, It wasn't inexpensive. It wasn't cheap. He said, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? Nope. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice from heaven came and says, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Here Jesus directly faces the terrible prospect of having to serve as the sin offering to God to atone for the sins of all people. And he did it with a very clear understanding of how horrible and tormenting it was going to be for him. His heart was in agony over the prospect of having to suffer God's fierce and full wrath for the sins he never committed, but for the sins of all the people of the world. And so, for a while, Jesus thought about asking God that the Father might spare him from this hellish torment, but he refused it. Why? Because he loved the Father and because he loved you and me. Jesus was not going to avoid the cross and the pains of hell. He would endure the suffering that was actually meant for us. In reply to Jesus, God the Father spoke encouraging words from heaven for Jesus to hear. He said, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The Father assured Jesus that he would succeed in his rescue mission, that he would bring glory to both God the Father and the Son. And then Jesus proceeded to explain what his death and resurrection was going to accomplish. By Jesus' death, God would punish the sins of the whole world and he would defeat Satan's efforts to take everyone to hell. Satan wasn't going to get his way. By his death, Jesus would bring people back to God where they always belonged. He would give them God's favor. He reminds us that this all happened because Jesus was totally committed to us. He gave all that he could give. He does all that he can do so that we can have life with God in all its fullness. Jesus is committed to us with his whole heart, with his whole being. God brings the truth of this divine commitment home to us when he brings us to saving faith in Jesus. For many of us, this happened when we were baptized, and we may not have even realized it was happening, but it did. God spiritually adopted you and me, and he made us his own children. In baptism, he pledged his loyalty to us by telling us, now I'm your God, and you are my child. He committed himself to give us all the blessings that he has, all that Jesus has won for us. In baptism, God obligated himself to keep all his promises to you. And consider just some of them. 
In Romans 8, verse 32, St. Paul assures us, God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not then also graciously give us all things? Whatever you need, God requires of himself to give it to you. If it is pardon for your sins, if it is peace in your turmoil, if it is comfort in your losses, if it's direction in your confusion, if it's help in your distress, if it's resources for your needs, God has bound himself to provide it to you. He's your God, you're his child. He's going to do it. And in Philippians 4.19, Paul puts an exclamation point on the promise. He says, my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Jesus Christ. God's going to do it, and he has the resources to make it happen. How blessed you and I are to be God's own people. How wonderful to know that Jesus has totally committed himself to us. Now, once God's total loving commitment to us registers in our minds and our hearts, then, and only then, do we become ready and willing and able to respond with our commitment to him. In his words to the Gentiles, Jesus talks about this commitment to him. He says, the man who loves his life will lose it, while the person who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and wherever my servant is, there will I be also. Or wherever I go, my servant will be there also. In these verses, Jesus speaks these paradoxical things that get our heads scratching, and we wonder, what did he just say? But he reminds us of this that the person who sinfully and selfishly puts himself before God, uncommitted, will end up losing all that truly matters. While the person who by God's enabling grace hates his life, now what does that mean? It doesn't mean hate yourself, but it means puts God first in his life so that when you think about love for God and love for yourself, the love for God is, is way ahead so that all the other loves look like hatred. <laughs> doesn't mean hate yourself, it just means love God so much that your love for yourself seems like hatred. That person will enjoy eternal life. Then Jesus says, whoever serves me will follow me. And these, with these words, Jesus tells us that the response that he requires and the response that he works in us is to be totally committed to him. As his people, we are to love and serve him like he did, with all of our heart for all of our life. Jesus calls us to be faithfully devoted to him. That's the fitting response. That's the commitment to respond with. Our loyalty and service to Jesus are not a payment for our salvation that's already been accomplished, but it is the natural fruit of faith that grows out of our thankful hearts. Jesus' love leads us to respond to jo his total commitment to us with our total commitment to him. Now, other believers have realized this and they have expressed in thankful devotion this thought in some beautiful ways. Charles Spurgeon said this, We are gods, so let us live and die to him. Missionary David Livingston said, Jesus is my king, my life, my all. Again, I dedicate my whole self to you, Jesus. Pastor Philip Henry said, I take God the Father to be my God. I take God the Son to be my Savior. I take God the Holy Spirit to be my sanctifier. I take the word of God to be my rule. I take the people of God to be my people. And I hereby dedicate and yield my whole self to the Lord. I do it intentionally, freely, 
and forever. Dedicating our whole self to Jesus Christ should be the easiest thing in the world for a Christian to do. Because God loves you and me so very much. And yet we often struggle with this commitment and dedication. Some have expressed our reluctance in this way. They say, Jesus Christ on our cross is how Calvary reads, right? We should have been there. Jesus on our cross is how Calvary reads. It is strange then that we Christians often think that we owe God nothing. Hmm? Why the poor response from us? Well, our sinful selfishness regularly pops up in our thinking. It stems maybe from our fearful lack of trust. We think that if, if we actually are totally committed to God, if we give him control of our whole life, what's to keep him from pouring it all down the drain? And it won't really amount to very much. Or maybe we're, we're just pretty lazy people, huh? And we don't want to be inconvenienced to do the things that God wants us to do, the better things he wants us to do. As if we were so smart, we could think of all the right things to do. Jesus encourages us past our weakness. He says, where I am, my servant will be also. My father will honor the one who serves me. What encouragement. He tells us that a life committed to Jesus brings joy and blessing. The world may crown things for success, but God crowns faithfulness, dedication, commitment, if you will. And God gives a far better crown than any other crown we could possibly seek to wear. Several days ago, I was talking with Pastor Mike Hudson, who, by the way, will be our guest speaker at our seniors' ministry this, this Wednesday morning. Uh, we were talking about life, and we were also talking, it just tended to drift over into the subject of commitment. What were we doing with our lives? And what should we be doing with our lives? I was digging down deep into the details, and he pulled me back from getting lost in the details. He said, yep, yeah, we got a lot to do, and... Just to remember, you know, we'll do them, but then don't forget about the heavenly promotion. <laughs> he was reminding us that at the end of our earthly life, there's a heavenly promotion for us. Maybe we work hard and serve, but we're going to get promoted to heaven one day, and that is going to be glorious. <coughs> ah, a life committed to Jesus Christ is also one where God lovingly would spare us from heartaches. Sometimes people think the uncommitted life is the way to go, right? Don't make promises. Don't, don't burden yourself down with commitments, especially to God. Those can be pretty severe. A man named George Her Horn made this observation. He said, when people stop being faithful to God, when they, don't want, when they want to live uncommitted lives, if that person expects other people to be faithful to each other, they will be deeply disappointed, right? If commitment to God breaks down, all bets are off. Can we, if we, if we are uncommitted and live just for ourselves, do you think we can expect other people to be committed to us and, and serve us well? No, it's all going to fall apart. We need commitment to God and to each other. Jesus directs us to express our commitment by serving him in some very practical and very ordinary ways. It doesn't see, always seem so grand, but it's so important. He points us to serve our family members and our friends. He says, go serve your parents, your spouse, your children. Go serve your friends and your neighbors. He points us to serve him through our work. Serve your employer well. Take care of your customers. Do your duties. Make sure the products and service you provide are great. He points us to serve in our society as a citizen, as a volunteer, and especially as God's witness to other people to be living letters that let people know about the Savior for sin, from sin and how badly 
other people in the world need us. Someone has observed, the people of the world need Christians the most when? They need Christians the worst when the world is at its worst. I think we can see that this world is not getting better, is it? It's getting worse and worse. And that's when Christians are needed the most. To let our light shine, to point people to their Savior, and glorify God. We are needed desperately right now to be involved in the lives of others. Jesus also points us to the church to serve God through our worship, our giving, our service, our fellowship with our brothers and sisters. Now, we could say these are all rather ordinary things, but they are special to our Savior. The person who does the most in God's big world is actually the one who does the best in his or her own little world. By God's grace, those people are you and me. Today, Jesus helps us rethink commitment. Remember that this Jesus devoted his whole self to you. Respond by thankfully devoting your whole self to him. And don't forget the heavenly promotion. Amen. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him that you overflow with hope by the power of his spirit. Amen. We rise now to make confession of our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. We continue on page 9. and We confess, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue on page 10 with our prayers of the day. Heavenly Father, you love the world and gave your Son to free us from sin and death by his obedient death on the cross. Lord of the Church, we thank you for the treasure of the Gospel. By your Spirit, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Strengthen our determination to do what pleases you, no matter what the danger or the cost. Guard and guide those who carry a cross in the name of Christ and face ridicule and persecution for the sake of the kingdom, missionaries and chaplains, young people who stand up for what is right in the face of pressure to do what is wrong, and all who pay a high price for their faith and values as Christians. Keep in your care those who carry heavy burdens in life, the sick and the chronically ill, the depressed and the lonely, those torn by conflict in personal relationships, those victimized by war and injustice, Comfort all who face the tears of life with a heavy heart. Grant them peace, O Lord, and in your mercy, your guardian and friend, their comfort and hope. Watch over those who care for others, pastors and counselors, physicians and nurses, social workers and caring friends, all who feed the hungry, comfort the hurting, and stand beside the dying. And hear us as we pray in silence. (laughs) 
Help us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Keep us faithful even to the point of death that we may receive the crown of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We also pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Receive with believing hearts the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Please be seated as we close with hymn 425. Thank you for being here in church today at uh, Christ Alone. Uh, welcome, especially guests and visitors that are with us this morning. We pray that uh, the, the, your time here was, uh, was a blessing to you and the message that you heard. Thank you, Pastor Witt, for uh, bringing us God's Word this morning, reminding us of, uh, of the commitment that Christ has made and shown to us time and time again, and uh, also thinking about the commitment uh, then that we uh, make to Jesus as Christians. So... Um, I'm uh, just very thankful that Pastor Witt has been able to uh, fill in for the past uh, few weeks, uh, been able to worship with my family uh, for a while and alongside each and every one of you. It's just a kind of a, a neat thing. So uh, thank you for, for doing that. And um, I think you mentioned yesterday that he had uh, retired in 2018, but uh, here he is uh, pulling him out of retirement just a little bit to help out. So we're thankful um, for his, uh, his gifts and for uh, bringing God's word here. Just a couple of uh, announcements before we dismiss. Uh, we do have uh, a couple of things on the horizon. We just sang, um, uh, go to dark Gethsemane, and we're going to be doing that uh, as a congregation in heart and mind. Uh, next week, you know, Easter is a pretty neat thing. It's a, in a couple of weeks. Uh, Easter is a pretty neat thing, but it means a whole lot more when you know what leads up to it. So we invite you to come back for each of the services during Holy Week. Uh, we have Palm Sunday next week. It's the exact same um, uh, 
Uh, service times as usual, Maundy Thursday will be 7 p.m., Good Friday, 7 p.m., and then two services on Easter, again, 8 o'clock and 10.30, breakfast in between. Um, so if you have an idea about what you might bring for breakfast, there's a, uh, a sheet out there in the lobby to sign up uh, for that community breakfast uh, potluck style uh, brunch. So we are looking forward to that. Easter for Kids is on the uh, day before Easter, so March 30th. Uh, if you haven't signed up for that, please do so that we know to expect you and we can prepare the right number of crafts and things like that and uh, gather the right number of volunteers and everything. Uh, this coming Saturday, that, uh, th that would be, um, what is that now, the 18th, the 23rd, thank you. Uh, that's going to be a property cleanup. If you are able to spend a few hours in the morning on Saturday, just kind of clearing out the flower beds and spreading mulch and cutting grass and that kind of thing, we would be uh, very appreciative of that. So we'll meet at 8 a.m. this coming Saturday. Tomorrow evening, um, Martin Luther, our sister church down in Sunset Hills, is hosting the Luther Prep Singers for a uh, spring concert as they're on their choir tour. Uh, I think this is as far south as they got. So they're, um, a, that's one of our worker training schools in Watertown, Wisconsin. They're um, doing their tours, going to local churches and things like that. So um, if you're interested in uh, hearing them, tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. at Martin Luther. Uh, I think that those are the major things I wanted to announce. So uh, until the Lord brings us back together again and in his name, may Jesus uh, keep you in his tender care. God bless your week. Mm -hmm.